Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Thursday, February 8th, 2024 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes or so as we prepare for the next market open. Overall, yesterday, another really good day in the market. I mean, we saw uh, the S&P 500 climb right up to that 5,000 level, back off at the close just a tad. Um, but overall, really another solid day. You'll see that the uh, leadership yesterday was strong as well. Anytime you're breaking out, I like to see what's driving that breakout. And uh, uh, if you know the way I follow the market, you know, I'm pretty happy that we saw technology, uh, discretionary communication services and some of the other uh, key aggressive groups doing well yesterday uh, during that breakout. So all in all, another good session. Yes, we're overbought. Yes, we have negative divergences. Uh, yes, we're about a week away from moving into a more bearish period of the market. But as I've said often, I've been saying it really since back in early November when we clearly started to break into this new rally. It is very, very difficult to bet against a secular bull market advance. Um, it waits for no prisoners. I, I received a lot of comments back in November when I was talking about how bullish I was and folks saying, you know, essentially maybe doing a little paraphrasing that I was irresponsible to talk about getting in at the top. Well, as we now know, a couple months later, that was not the top. Markets continued moving to new all-time highs. And I think when we're maybe geared to believe that the market has to go lower, then yeah, you think every day is a top when we go to a new high. Um, but I believe the end of the year, we're going to be higher next year. I think we're going to be higher. And so getting in in November, uh, not only with hindsight, but even back at that time made perfect sense to me because I believe markets going higher. Anyhow, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the action from yesterday and get this party started. Got the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 156 points, S&P 500 up 41. And there was your 49.95 close, 49.95 special. Uh, NASDAQ 100 up 182 points. That is another more than 1%. Going up closing 17.755. I was looking to see the NASDAQ get through 17.7. We did it yesterday, setting a new all-time high. Uh, if you look at the AD lines, AD lines on these three indices looks really good. Yes, we have negative divergences still in play, but many times as prices go higher, you can eliminate those divergences. I don't know if that's what's going to happen or not, but right now, like I said, it's just hard to bet against the secular bull market. Mid caps uh, also up about 13 points. That was a half of 1%. Small caps uh, down slightly, down about a half of uh, a point, which was about a quarter of 1%. So still the small caps struggling to move higher. As it does move lower, though, I am seeing better signs on the AD line as we actually attempt a breakout on the AD line. So this pullback appears to be, um, at least based on the AD line, it appears to be accumulated or appears to be a, a period of accumulation. Uh, transports, really strong day yesterday. Came up, finished above 16,000, nearly above the 16.1 level on the verge of a breakout. That AD line certainly picking back up again, looking pretty strong. And then as we move on to the sectors, you can see technology rising 1.3%, uh, not quite to a new high. It had pulled back all the way to that 20-day moving average, and now it's coming back, threatening another breakout. Maybe we see that today. We'll have to kind of monitor action, the action and see. Uh, discretionary stocks up 1.1%, materials up 4 uh, or excuse me, up uh, eight tenths of 1%, four fifths of 1%. Um, so those were your three leaders. I believe the only groups lower yesterday were consumer staples. And I want to say real estate. Um, but basically the defensive groups were lagging uh, on the session yesterday, which is what you expect when you break to an all-time high. Um, the U.S. truckers leading. That's part of the transportation group I was just talking about. We've seen a lot more strength in, in the uh, transportation area of late. Truckers, we've got railroads uh, been picking up some. Uh, airlines, I think, led the market yesterday or the day before. Uh, it was a top performing industry group. So we're definitely getting a lot more strength coming into the transport area. And again, looking back at that trend chart, 
We're very, very close to a breakout. Um, as you maybe draw a line across here at the top, you can see rising lows off of an uptrend. That is a bullish um, ascending triangle pattern. And a breakout would measure up to, well, probably measure up another 900 points or so, maybe close to 1,000 points, which would take us up to the 17,000 level or maybe just above. And if transports are doing that, that's probably going to be a very, very good sign for the S&P. So again, watch for that breakout there on the transports. Um, also, life insurance doing very well yesterday, coming back up through the 50-day moving average, trying to clear that 20-day moving average. I actually did so by about one point. Going to need a little bit more um, confirmation, I think, on that index than that. And then uh, semiconductors, you can see, having another very, very strong day up, uh, uh, what is this, 2.14%. So strong action really just about everywhere in the market yesterday. Really, uh, uh, even on the sector side, not really anything selling off. The ones that were down uh, were down less than one-tenth of 1%. One so it was just another solid day, fairly wide participation, which we like, um, and further movement to the upside. 10-year Treasury yield. And I do want to go in and take a look. I have not looked yet at the uh, economic reports out this morning. But of course, jobless claims always out Thursday morning unless there's a holiday. So jobless claims came in 218,000. Expectation was 222,000. But last week we revised 3,000 higher, pretty much offsetting the 4,000 we came in lower. So uh, not really anything big there, kind of as expected. And then uh, let's see what else we had. I thought there were other reports. Um, actually, wholesale inventories come out at 10 a.m. This has been a very, very, very light week in terms of economic reports. Um, almost nothing out this week. Um, and so that'll that'll pick up a little bit next week. So the market's focusing on a couple of things. It's focusing technically, uh, looking at the market. Of course, when you keep setting new highs, that's going to encourage more and more buyers. Um, we are historically moving into a fairly solid period where the market tends to do pretty well, I would say really through next week. Um, but then we've got options expiring next Friday. And the week after next week is one of the uh, more bearish weeks once we get past February 15th. So I, I think after that, after options expiration, I believe that Monday is President's Day. So we'll have the market closed. And uh, I believe that is on the 20th of February. Um, I'd have to double check that date, but uh, today's the 8th, so tomorrow will be the 9th, 16th. No, it'll be the 19th. So the 19th of February, Monday, the 19th is President's Day. The market will be closed. It'll be a three-day weekend, and then we'll come back on the Tuesday, the 20th. And that is when I would be a little bit more cautious if we haven't already started to decline. Uh, that first day after option expiration can be rough, um, and the market certainly is set up for, for some sort of a pullback at some time. So if we continue to keep these legs going in this bull market for the next week or so, you know, I'll be looking for other signs, maybe money rotating into a little bit more defensive areas as we move toward the, the uh, second half of February. I've got a chart I'll show you. I was going to show it yesterday. And then, of course, didn't really have the screen to be able to pull charts up. But anyway, let me uh, keep moving on here. We got some other things to talk about. S&P 500. There was your breakout. Yesterday's high, I know maybe you don't pay attention to these round numbers, but yesterday's high was 4,999.89. So we actually had one-tenth of a point left before we were ready to reach that 5,000 level. Uh, we backed off of it 49.95 this morning. Uh, futures were down. Let me tell you where we are right now. So if I just pull up an intraday, the diamonds... DIA, which tracks the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, actually up 0.13. So maybe we've gotten a little bit of reversal here. Um, the Spider eh, still down 0.05%, so almost unchanged. Excuse me, the QQQ down 0 0.06. Uh, again, essentially unchanged. And then we have the IWM, which has been weak and was weak, well, down 0.03%. So not really much there either. So it looks like we're going to open pretty flat this morning and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, but you can still see now the PPO is rising, but 
from this high to this high still do have a negative divergence, as I've said before. I think the further and further you get out, this kind of goes away, um, the negative divergence. And uh, when I go through the NASDAQ 100 here, I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, you got to, there's got to be somewhere where you kind of draw the line and you no longer go back and look at prior highs. I mean, here I could even make the argument. I mean, if you want a literal argument that back in June, the PPO on the daily chart was up at about three and price action was at 15.2. Well, look at where we are now. Price action is much higher than where we were back here. PPO is lower than where we were back here. I mean, by definition, you have higher prices and a lower PPO. But I don't think most people look at this and go all the way back here. So it's a question, where do you, how far do you go back? Normally what I do is as soon as you get a 50-day test, the divergence is over. It's played out. You've gone all the way back to the center line, which means there's no momentum. So that is what I call a reset. Um, so that's a PPO reset. And now the market's free to go whichever way it wants in terms of momentum. Uh, we eventually came back up after the correction and started that new uptrend, that new bullish momentum uh, in November, set a slightly higher high in December. And now we were just slightly lower in January. So technically there is a negative divergence here. So, and we're breaking out again with the PPO lower. Do we continue going up? Does the PPO turn up and eliminate these prior highs? If so, then there's no negative divergence. And most people, when they look at negative or divergences, they'll look back and with history, you can always tell which ones worked and which ones didn't. I mean, if we keep going higher and this PPO turns up above about 2.1, this negative divergence will be gone. And anybody that uses history and looks back will never even recognize that there was a negative divergence in play. I followed a little bit closer. And so I know that these divergences are signals, but they're not guarantees. And, you know, you got to put a lot of signals together to come up with a much more confident call. I mean, I've talked probably for the last two weeks, three weeks about the negative divergence here on the NASDAQ 100. And yet we keep going higher. Here we did get a 20-day test, but we haven't seen the PPO reset. I mean, if you go back and you look long-term, go back five years, daily chart. I mean, the PPO, all it does is go above the zero line, below the zero line, back above the zero line. Sometimes maybe get a little hesitation like we did during the correction right around the center line or a little bit below. But for the most part, all it is is up and down, up and down, up and down. Why would we take price action here and look at price action here and compare PPOs? Makes no sense. Most everyone watching probably would agree with that. But how about this one versus this one? Now we're getting a little closer, higher prices. That PPO is much higher. Should we consider that? My answer is no. We had the reset here. So we're starting over. PPO goes up and down above the zero line all the time. When it hits zero, there's no momentum. Ignore all those prior highs. Otherwise, what would you do with, take one to the extreme here. How about the NASDAQ high on a monthly chart back in 2000? Look at where the PPO was. Every time we've cleared this high for the last 10 years, we still have a negative divergence in play, right? We don't get rid of the negative divergence till the PPO gets over 30. Well, I'm going to wish you luck on getting up to 30 on a monthly PPO. So I understand the textbook definition, but we have to apply some common sense. And a lot of technical analysis is like that. Too many folks I see are just literally looking at the lines. This line's doing that. This line's doing that. That means this. I don't look at the market like that. I need to see, uh, it, it need, the picture needs to make sense. Anyway, keep moving. IWM, this is the one that's been lagging. Um, I definitely believe the small uh, to mid-sized banks are a big deal, big part of this. But we've seen the biotech's not doing too bad. Lately, we've seen transports going up. And I can tell you a lot of times transports and the IWM tend to move together. So it's a little, you know, I'm scratching my head right now. And that's kind of what I've been doing watching this chart, scratching my head, trying to figure out 
why it's not participating. Uh, I know part of the reason definitely is the banks, but the banks are only about eight, nine percent of the IWM. So it's not like it's 50 percent of the IWM. Seems like other areas that normally move the IWM are not doing so right now. Um, it's kind of hard to go back and look at 2000 charts to try and figure it out because that's what you have to do with the IWM. The IWM is just a compilation. If you look at the Russell 3000, the um, IWM is the 2000 smallest companies within the Russell 3000. The Russell 1000 is actually a large cap index. I know some people think Russell and they think small cap. Russell 1000 is large cap. It's the 2000 that are the lower 2000 in the Russell 3000. Those are the ones that make up the IWM. And that's why when you have that such wide diversification like that, it's really difficult to pinpoint one area that's impacting the IWM unless you start at the top like the banks. And clearly the banks are. I mean, if we pull up the KRE, um, you can see KRE, which is the ETF that tracks the uh, regional banks. Uh, there's a bunch of small and mid-sized banks in there. You can see, I mean, it's been going down since the second week of December. Couldn't, couldn't get that breakout. And now coming back down, I do like yesterday's hammer. We'll see if that hammer is out of bottom. Um, the big breakout level, and I guess to the downside, probably would be 45 at this point. I mean, I know I talked about 48, 49, but once you lose that support level, you got to look, try and find the next one. The next one would be, it looks like after making this move up, it wouldn't make sense to have an inverse head and shoulder because the inverse head comes almost down to the low. So on a continuation pattern, you wouldn't want that coming all the way back down here. But it kind of looks like that pattern where you've got the uh, left side, left shoulder come down, or excuse me, come down here to the left shoulder. Then you have the neckline and the, the head, then the right side of the neckline, which is slightly upsloping, then the right shoulder, and then the breakout. So this neckline right here would come in somewhere around 45. Yesterday's low was 45.67. Hammer, maybe that's it. Maybe not. And banks have been so unbelievably weak here over the past week or so. Uh, but hey, we can hold out hope and watch the chart and see. But I really would like to see that turn. Um, if we look at a longer term chart, like the weekly chart, you can see we haven't closed out this week yet. If we finish strong, we could have a great test of support right at the 20 week moving average, 47.50, which was kind of gap resistance. I think that was up closer, maybe to. 48.50. And then you've got, you know, we came back up, we tested that area, put in a higher low, then we put in the higher high. Now we're testing the 20 week moving average. If we can get a little strength the next couple of days between today and tomorrow, we could see maybe a hammer right on the 20 week moving average. Maybe that's a bottom on the banks, something to watch. But I think this is going to be a critical group to get the IWM going. It's proven to be up till now anyway. Transports. So this is what I was talking about. Actually, big, big day on Monday or Tuesday. Yesterday, we went up and tested the 16.2 level before backing off of it. Might have even had a, might have actually hit that high. 16.198.95. See what these other highs were. That was 16.174, 16.167. And that one was 16.149. So yes, we did set a, I don't know, six month high on the transports yesterday, intraday. So still got some work to do, didn't make a breakout. We backed off of it, but starting to look much, much better. We have an uptrend, looks maybe like a little bit of a cup. Maybe we have a handle still left to go back down to 15.8 or so. Um, but this definitely, definitely looks like some type of continuation pattern off of an uptrend. So a breakout there would be very bullish. All right, let's keep moving. Let's go on to the chart of the day. For those of you who are new, first of all, welcome. Uh, I certainly appreciate you checking out the show today. Um, if you are new to the show, if you go over to earningsbeats.com, both plural, earningsbeats, um, and then scroll down, you'll see first at the top, we have a 30-day no-cost trial. You can come in, try our service for 30 days, kick the tires, see everything we have to offer, basically, and then uh, decide if our service fits your style. Um, we also have a free download. If you haven't done this, why not? I've done thousands of hours of research on history and history does repeat itself. You've got to check out some of these 
uh, historical patterns. Um, there are some historical strategies to consider when approaching the stock market, especially if technicals happen to line up in that same direction. Gives you a lot more confidence to place that trade. And it's free. F-R-E-E. -E, free, 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 free. Uh, so check that out. And then also another free part of our service. We really try to reach out and build a community. We have our free Earnings Beats Digest newsletter, which is published three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Friday mornings. Name and email address. That's all you need. Um, hit that subscribe button. We'll get you set up. It's a very, very quick read. If you're already subscribing to 14 newsletters and you're like, I don't have time, it's a quick one. It's probably going to be one of the quickest you have. Two paragraphs in a chart. Can't make it much more simple. Try to get it out before the market opens. Hopefully you can check that out. So again, free, free, free. Um, let me show you the chart of the day that we had from yesterday. This is Nike. I'll stretch it out a little bit on the chart here. So you can see it a little bit better. But here's Nike. What I had pointed out yesterday was that we had this nice bullish engulfing candle. Um, volume picked up a little bit. It was one of the heaviest days probably over the last six weeks in terms of volume. So you got a nice reversal. But the key here was the reversal came with a positive divergence. The prior day's low close below 100 was clearly the lowest close here. So we had lower close and we had a higher PPO. That's positive divergence. When I see that, I believe the risks of getting to the 50-day moving average um, or the odds of getting back to the 50-day moving average grow um, quite a bit, rather significantly. And so I was just saying that while Nike clearly has not been a good chart, and I'll show you in a, in a minute why, it does in the near term look like it's going to go higher. So again, that came out yesterday or um, Wednesday morning. So Wednesday's action continued that push. And we actually saw the first significant close above the 20-day moving average since we gapped down back in late December. So again, that signal, that was a signal saying we should look for continuing move to the upside. Once we get back up to the 50 day, we're probably going to get to the center line. Again, that's a reset. Don't know where it's going to go from there. But if we do get up to that 107, 108 area, that's also getting very close to this gap resistance level as well. So all of this right in here, this high right here was maybe 111. And then this high was 110. And then you've got the uh, 50 day, which is up not too far from 109, 108.47. Um, so that one, I would say 108.50 up to 111 is resistance. So I'm not looking for a massive move in Nike, but this tells me like if I was shorting the stock because it's been such an awful per performer, and if I do short, which I don't in a secular bull market, but if I were to, I would want to find a weak stock in a weak industry group. That's the, that's the type of stock that I would short. I would not try to short overbought stocks because overbought in a secular bull market advance just becomes more and more overbought. I mean, if you're trying to short NVIDIA or how about super micro SMCI, I mean, stocks like this that just seem like they're way overpriced, they're being repriced because of such great fundamental news. And the market's looking ahead, lower interest rates, higher growth rates. I don't know where those stocks are gonna stop to the upside. I certainly wouldn't wanna be trying to bet against them. Um, but anyway, here, you can see once, if you were shorting a stock like Nike, this type of action would tell me to cover, even if it's just in the short term. Get up to 108, 109, maybe open a, reopen a short as a trader. But once you get that positive divergence and then you get the reversing candle on top of it, that makes me a little bit more nervous. I feel like I've got potentially more downside, maybe giving away some of my profit. And so I would rather just book my money and you know, if it breaks back down again, you always jump back in. That's the way I look at it. Or let it do its thing to the upside. And if you're ready to short, jump back in at 108, 109, and let Nike prove to you that it can get through major resistance. All right, four more minutes to go. I wanted to uh, give you a couple of charts. Um, I'm going to show you a chart of how a typical presidential election year plays out. This is the average, what I've done is I've created a user-defined index at stock charts. So I've gone back and determined all the data based on my own uh, 
you know, it's actually based on an Excel spreadsheet that I've, that I've tracked. But essentially what I'm doing is going back and getting the average gains eat daily throughout election years. And then I just plotted that on a, on one chart. Now I think it probably, yeah, it's going out. I need to go back to, um, let's go back one year, one month, and let's go five days. I'm trying to get back to the beginning of the year. Um, maybe 10 days. All right, there we go. So here was the beginning. And you can see in the first quarter, we tend to move higher from, you know, into February. And then historically, when you get toward the latter part of February through the first couple of weeks of March, that's historically, that doesn't mean that's the way it's going to play out this year. It may or may not. But when you go back and take the average performance of all of the presidential election years since 1950, so that's 1952, 1956, 1960, 64, 68, all the way through 220 or 2020. If you take all of those years and take averages for each day, this is how I calculated this. This is how the year typically plays out on average during a presidential election year. Now, I just want to point out a couple of things. Number one, you get this weakness a little bit in the first quarter. First quarter doesn't, isn't really that great from start to finish. We start to pick back up as we go into earnings. And then as earnings die off, we come back down one more time, make a run through summer, and then September, October, which tend to be weak months, and you're getting very close to the election. So if there's maybe some uncertainties because of the election itself, you could see some weakness in the market. And that is where we tend to get the deepest sell-off is September, October, right before the election. And then we push higher into the election and then look at how we finish the year. So all of this uncertainty is over the first, or the, the Tuesday in November. Was it first Tuesday after the first Monday? Because I don't think it's the first. I don't, I think it would be like the eighth. Anyway, whenever that is, I mean, basically the beginning of November, you can see we really don't have much weakness. And then we get into that seasonally bullish period and we take off just like we do in almost every other year. So this is how a presidential election year typically plays out. And just wanted to point that out. All right, um, what I'm gonna do, it's 929. I am, oh, I did wanna show you this chart. So if you look only at the first quarter, and this is on the NASDAQ, and this goes back to 1971. This is 53 years of history on the NASDAQ. When you break down the first quarter, first half of the first quarter, which is January 1st to February 15th, and then the second half of the first quarter, February 16th to March 31st, look at how the annualized performance compares. 31 percentage points different. Now, I had a member when I was talking about um, annualized returns. And um, in our uh, weekly market report, I always give all of our members the next, uh, I think it's like two weeks of data, historical data for the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, or actually for the NASDAQ composite and the Russell 2000. And what I do is I give them the next two week look ahead to tell them, okay, this is the annualized return of each of the 14 days. And I had a question come in asking me, well, what do these percentages mean? Like I saw one was 40%. Does that mean that this day goes up 40% of the time? No, it means that for that day, the annualized return, how that day is performed on the S&P 500 since 1950. So you might say, well, one day, that doesn't really tell you much. Well, it doesn't, but if you stream together five or six or seven days and all of them are strong, it tells you you have a pretty bullish uh, historical week. Well, what I am telling you is that this is 45 days worth of action every year since 1971 on the NASDAQ composite. And I think it's pretty clear which half of the uh, quarter you want to be invested in and which half, who cares? Now, today is February 8th. 
The first half ends on February 15th. The next week, historically, is pretty strong. And I would, I'd would i go out on a limb and say exceptionally strong on small caps. It's actually pretty strong on all of them. But when I was looking at some of the numbers on the small caps, it's really a very bullish week ahead from now through next Friday on small caps. So maybe history will help. Nothing else seems to be helping the small caps. Maybe history will help. But once we get past the end of next week, especially looking at the NASDAQ, that's when we tend to just, that's when traders get frustrated. They probably don't even know why. But you're in a stock, Meta's been flying, NVIDIA has been flying, and then all of a sudden you're in them and they're going nowhere and you, you know, they, you get in, they pull back, and then you get back out and then they go back up and you jump in, they pull. It's just choppy action, very, very hard to trade. Um, that's basically what happens in the second half of the first quarter. So just wanted to point that out. But let's go ahead and take a look uh, quickly at uh, how we're opening. Um, pretty flat. I mean, we got the Dow up 30, S&P down one and a half, NASDAQ down two. I mean, these are very small fractions. S&P, small cap index down a little bit more, but mid caps are higher. So we got even bifurcated action between small and mid cap stocks. Um, the VIX back down under 13, closed under 13 yesterday. I'm telling you folks, when that VIX stays down, everybody got a lot of folks thinking that when the VIX is low, that's bearish. I absolutely 150% disagree with any of you that say that. And I, we can pull up the numbers. When the VIX is below 20, definitely when it's below 17, especially when it's below 13, that's when the stock market performs its absolute best. And I dare you to go find information that refutes that. I love the VIX down here at 13. Cannot emphasize that enough. That essentially, when I look at sentiment, I look at the equity only put call ratio. That sentiment is based on what individual stock traders are doing, the retail traders. When you look at the VIX, the VIX is based on the pricing of S&P 500 options in the near term. Who sets the, the uh, premium on those options? Market makers which in my opinion are probably the most important people in the market because they are the one that basically is directing prices all over the place. They trade for their own accounts. They make money. Why? They see the order flow, number one. I mean, that's pretty obvious. If I knew, if everybody had to go through me to tell me whether they wanted to buy or sell, I could probably do a lot better in the stock market. I would know exactly what's coming in. Oh, we got four of you want to buy and only one of you want to sell. Okay. Hmm. Maybe I'll get my order in first and then we'll take everybody else's order. I don't know. I mean, got to be careful there. I'm not, I don't know what, what everybody, all the different market makers are doing, but this system sets up for some rather unscrupulous behavior by market make, makers. But anyway, getting back to my point, the VIX basically is established by the, what the market makers see down the road. And when they're pricing, when the VIX is priced down under 13, that's a recipe for market bullishness. And again, anybody want to debate? It's going to be a really quick debate. Um, I, I'm pretty convicted with a lot of things, but I'm very convicted about the VIX. So uh, if somebody comes up to you at your next party uh, and wants to talk about the VIX, make sure they know if it's under 13, there's not even a, we don't need to debate it. Um, if it's under 17, I don't really want to debate it. But anyhow, there are some that do. Um, that's, good. that's it for me. We're going to go ahead and wrap up last show of the week. Again, I uh, want to thank all of you for tuning in, especially those of you that are new. Please hit the like button. That really helps us in our YouTube uh, algorithms. Uh, hit that like button. Make sure everybody out there knows you like the video and our style and our approach. And also subscribe to our channel. It would help us out quite a bit. Uh, have a great rest of your week and weekend, everybody. And cheers to S&P 500 5000. Happy trading.